Fix your eyes on heaven tonight. Let's worship the Lord together. Father, we love you. We thank you for the opportunity to be here. Help us to worship you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. It's empty grace, treasures that fade, never enough. Come on, sing, then you came, you came along. You put me back together. Every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Come on, sing, there's nothing. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, oh, there's nothing, nothing.
worshiping with us and joining us for our midweek online service. I'm going to break it up a little bit this week instead of moving forward in our study of the book of Acts. I want to share something I believe God is laying on my heart. It's a little bit of a burden that I'm carrying right now as I watch probably a little too much of my friends and other others that I may follow on social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, etc., etc., etc. As you know, a couple of weeks ago, actually I, I believe last week, and then throughout 2020, it seemed like there's like this new fad out there, if you will. It's the new buzzword, the trendy action. It's what you're supposed to do when something is going on that you don't like or something is not going on that you would like. It is you should gather and protest peacefully, of course, um, but to protest. Uh, let's go protest. That's just, it seems like, now I know that this isn't a new idea. It just seems to be catching and become, becoming more popular over the specifically last 365 days. I know it's happened in our history in the past. It's sometimes part of the process and then sometimes even uh, a way to form a movement. Here is the problem with protesting. And, and I'm, I'm not really mentioning or making a reference to the civil rights movement. Because that was a movement. And I understand that that involved some protesting and that was an issue of major immorality so we've got to be very careful just drawing hard lines here and and not getting on a soapbox or a personal opinion but here's my biggest problem with protesting I can't find it in the New Testament it's just I'm looking I asked our staff, I've asked around, my problem with this new trend and reaction to whatever is or is not going on in our nation specifically, I can't find protesting in the New Testament. I agree, we are to be the light in the darkness, and sometimes peacemaking involves engaging in the process and not standing silent. I get that you are definitely supposed to speak up for those who have no voice. We are called to condemn evil and and sinful behavior and be the prophetic voice of God. I, I agree with all of that. And so if, if you're wondering what the Bible says or has to say about protesting, I, I would encourage you to, to go and study as, as, as I was looking in and, and deliberating and, and asking in a multitude of counsel and, and certainly the Holy Spirit to help me with this because I don't want it to just be something that I'm frustrated about. Um, and the Bible doesn't specifically address anything about protest that I can see um, a specific biblical absolute. There's a lot of interpretations, a lot of things that you could pull. But here's what I do know. I do know that we can learn from the example of the one we follow. So I'm just going to leave that up there for a minute. I know that we can learn from the example of the one we follow. And so, when I don't know what to do, and I was faced with that multiple times in 2020, as I actually preached on a couple of Sundays ago, what do we do in the face of social injustice, which is reality for people, no matter how some other people may feel about it? 
because reality is perspective and people have the perspective of social injustice and inequality. And so if that's how somebody feels, that's their reality. And what do we do in the face of social injustice? What do we do when it feels like democracy is in danger? And some people may not feel like democracy is in danger and, and other people are, are ready to pull all of their supplies out of their um, buried protective housing and, and get ready to engage in the next great battle. What do we do in the face of deplorable um, and immoral agendas from the 60s and 70s and 80s um, all the way up into what we may see or what we have seen and these agendas being pushed and, and politicized what do we do in the face of defunding and defamation of law and order and, and those who make sure that law and order is carried out and, and these things are promoted or at least they're not condemned so they're tolerated and they're accepted and then there's this hard line or there's this opposite end or I feel one way about this protest and one way about this protest and I'm focused on this about this protest and, and this about this protest and, and lives are being disrespected and disregarded across the board. What do we do? What do we say? How do we act? What can we do for justice in this nation? Well, in all the protesting, and I know that this is a little bit cheesy, but I, I don't care. Because I believe that we're supposed to become prepared. And one of the ways that I believe we're going to see the hand of God in this nation is I believe we need to become a pray tester. Now, as opposed to a protest store, I believe we need to become pray testers. Like, not testing God with our prayers, but testing prayer. Praying, interceding, going to the only one that can really do anything about the real enemy. I'll say this here. Big tech is not the real enemy. Big farm is not the real enemy. Mainstream media is not the real enemy. Politicians are not the real enemy. Social media CEOs are not the real enemy. Listen, we cannot forget that the real enemy enemy is not a person or a leader that is human it's the real enemy behind all of these things and his name is lucifer and the powers of principalities of darkness that fell with him in his arrogance the enemy is the real enemy and when we forget that we begin to see the people that we're supposed to be praying for and winning for the sake of the gospel as the enemy. Let me say it this way. When we pick sides, we ostracize the other side. I, I, I hope this message doesn't make too many people mad, but I, I really believe I'm, I'm sharing with a core on Wednesday night. A very important message from my heart as a pastor, specifically of new hope in Eunice. When we pick sides, and listen, when we protest, we pick sides. When we protest, we pick sides. And I had to ask the age-old question today. When we sat in a meeting together and we were deliberating and we prayed and we sought the Holy Spirit and we looked into Scripture... Whose side would Jesus be on right now in America? And I'm not going to start naming all the different organizations or the different political parties. But whose side would Jesus be on? That is the question that a Jesus follower has to ask. Because I want to be where he is. And I don't want to protest and pick a side that Jesus might not be all in on. Because when we pick sides, we ostracize the other side. 
We separate ourselves. We draw a hard line. Our Christianity, our witness, our example on social media. When we pick a side, when we promote only one side of the argument, we ostracize the other side of the argument. And you cannot win people you're fighting against. You can only win people you're fighting for or fighting with to come to a common ground or common solution. I'm, I'm hoping that we begin to create some pray testers. Um, whether God answers in the way I wanted or didn't want, I pray. I seek his face. I, I find where he is and I stand there. Whether God answers in a way I didn't want. What if, what if, hang with me, what if what I want is not his perfect will? What if what I'm wanting and what I'm praying for and what I'm hoping for and what I wish would happen is not God's perfect will? plan what if what I thought would be the perfect solution for me is not God's perfect plan for all I'm, I'm trying to think as a New Testament believer outside of my patriotism outside of my Western Christianity, outside of the fact that I'm an American, because I am an American and I love this land. I am a Louisianian. Go Tigers. I didn't send anybody a congratulatory Alabama National Championship message, nor would I. You won. Congratulations. I don't care. Go Tigers. That's who I am. I'm okay with who I am. But listen, when those things get in the way of the fact that I am a follower of Jesus first, and sometimes only, that is who I am. I am not an American before I'm a Christian. I'm not a fan before I am a follower. I am a follower first. So what if what I wanted isn't God's will? I like this phrase. Jonathan says it to the man that follows him up the hill and into battle as he begins to consider facing the Philistines with just two people. He says, perhaps the Lord. Perhaps the Lord. Now Jonathan says... We'll move on our behalf, but this one came to me. Perhaps the Lord has an even more perfect plan. I know a lot of people that thought God was absolutely sovereign when their candidate that they were praying for won an election. At the municipal level, at the state or federal level, God's sovereignty came through. We celebrated. And now... I know a lot of people that don't feel that way. Some, I know some people personally that still do. Because they were praying for a different outcome. And they love Jesus. And they don't necessarily put their Christianity behind a candidate. And maybe sometimes they do. And I can agree or disagree. But it doesn't change who I am. So when God answers, no matter how he answers, no matter who he puts in authority... No matter what policy ends up passing, because sometimes people miss God's will. As we saw in the 60s when prostitution and pornography were legalized. And again and again in the 70s and 80s when abortion was legalized. And, we're, and that's not the end of it. And those are moral issues. Those are biblical absolutes. So I'll preach literally the Hades, just to save my language, out of those things in Jesus' name. But when we just preach the same way about everything, people can't separate our soapbox from our scripture. God's answer is always yes and amen. I'm going to sing that this Sunday. That's his answer. But it's only his answer if we're praying his promises. See, 
all his promises are yes and amen. If we're praying our preference and not his promises, his answer may not be yes or amen. His answer is only yes and amen if we're praying his promises. And I read this somewhere, I can't remember who or where to give credit, but I read that God never answers no to your prayer request. He answers yes, he answers not yet, I've seen that often, or he answers wait, I've got something better, or I have a bigger plan. I I challenged our staff you're welcome to work on it um, yourself. Uh, don't don't pull something out of uh, context and and try to make doctrine out of one out of one verse. But but show me a passage of scripture in context that justifies a Jesus follower follower joining a protest. Peaceful or not? Where where in scripture do we see? The only thing I can think of off the top of my head is Dr. Martin Luther King and the way that he walked, but he didn't fight back. The only thing I can think of as a modern day example, you know, our first thought whenever I asked this question was, was Jesus praying in the garden? By the way, you can read that prayer in John chapter 17. Go read Jesus's prayer. In the Garden of Gethsemane, the evening before his arrest or of his arrest and uh, brutal beating and unjustified crucifixion and death, read Jesus' prayer because we can always hang our hat on the one that we follow. Jesus prayed in the garden, we know this, not my will but thine, O Lord. And then he comes out of that time of prayer and Peter is ready to fight against his arrest. Peter is ready to go to battle on the Capitol steps. It was actually in the Garden of Gethsemane, but the Washington Monument slash Garden of Gethsemane. Peter was ready to go. He pulled out his sword and he cut off the ear of one of those who came to arrest his friend unjustly. And Jesus told him, get back in line. I don't need a protester. I asked you to pray with me and you went to sleep. Now you want to fight? See, Jesus asked Peter three times. Come pray pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. Had to wake him up as he was praying, sweating blood in anxiety and anticipation of what he was about to go through. And now Peter's awake. Oh, I'm ready to fight. Jesus asked him to fight in prayer. Not in protest. In fact, he corrected him. Peter, sheath your sword. Here's what he was saying. Peter, get back in line. Follow me. Follow me. When we pick sides, we ostracize. And so instead of picking sides, I would encourage. In fact, I guess maybe I would even just challenge. I believe we can pick sides or we can pray for salvation. And, and I'm telling you, I'm having to choose right now. Between all that's happened and taken place over the last 365 days, my, my natural man wants to pick a side. But the pastor's heart and the spirit man says pray. Pray for salvation. Pray for unity. Don't pick a side. Find the balance. Find the common ground. Pull people together. Prepare the church for what is and what is on the way. Prepare the church to be more focused on the kingdom than they are the culture. Instead of picking sides, I am encouraging anyone listening to this at any time to begin to pray. I was challenged just this week. A politician I'm not a big fan of. I won't say a gender or name. I shared this in our roundtable. My first thought was, man, 
that person is a devil, man, is a devil. Thought it in my head. And the Holy Spirit said, well, then why don't you pray? Why don't you pray? You know, it's, I feel like this is like Saul in Acts chapter 9. We went over that here Wednesday night just a few weeks ago. Um, what if it's God's plan to put the person I can't stand in a position I did not want? What if it's God's plan to put the person I did want in the position I wanted, but that goes against what somebody else wanted. What do we do? Our mind went to Saul. Saul, the president-elect, I mean the Jewish elite. Saul, the one who was uh, murdering Christianity. Or at least advocating it. Maybe he didn't throw the stone, but he stood there and watched while the stones were thrown. Saul could easily be accused, um, as accusations are right now. Saul could be accused of inciting the violence in his speech. There. Picked on both sides. What if Saul would have just stayed a Jewish leader. He never became Paul a missionary. Imagine what we would be missing in Christendom. Well, what caused, what did God use as part of Saul's deliverance? It wasn't just a visitation from Jesus. Certainly it launched from there. I don't have this scripture in your notes. You can ref reference it. But in Acts chapter 9, the Bible says that there was a disciple named Ananias. And Ananias was praying. So the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. See, you don't hear from God in a vision if you're not spending time with God. Or if the only time you do spend with God is praying out of your problems or your pain or your preference. That's why I have been a divine echo of something that I know someone said to me. We need to pray out of God's promises. Ananias was a disciple in Damascus who was praying. And God used him. Ananias wasn't out protesting Saul's defamation and deplorable agenda. Ananias was praying. We need some pray testers, some people who would test themselves in prayer. Yeah, but Chris, pastor, preacher, young man, I have the right to bear arms. Sheath your sword. Peter, I have the right to freedom of speech. I have the right to protest. And listen, I, I say, as an American, you're right. You are right to feel this way. I would be correct as an American. But I'm asking, evaluate with me. Let's seek God together in this as I wrap this thing up tonight. Does my biblical Jesus following conviction justify all of these things that I perceive as inalienable rights? Well, let's look at a few things our Savior said. Matthew 5, 38. Turn the other cheek. Somebody slaps you on one. I picked about this this past Sunday in the message, Run With the Horses. Slap them, Jesus. That's semi what Jeremiah prayed. Prepare the sheep for the slaughter, David. Knock the teeth out of the enemy. 
Jesus said, hang on, guys. Hang on. Hang on. Jeremiah, David, Peter, Chris. Hang on. I said when somebody slaps you on one cheek, turn the other cheek. Well, yeah, but you got to establish a cheek to turn. Look, I'm not saying that you need to be a doormat for people to just wipe their feet on. What about my freedom of speech? Well, Paul wrote, Paul, not Saul, because Ananias was praying. Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, Let no unwholesome speech come from your mouth. Watch what else Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19. Though I am free, I'm free. That's what Paul said. We live in the land of the free, home of the brave, because of the sacrifice of many people. And I'm grateful. And I don't like the idea that some of those people feel disrespected. On the other hand, I don't like the idea that other people have felt unequal. And maybe their father or grandfather or at the least great-grandfather or grandmother felt the same way. And I've talked to some of those people on each side. Paul said, though I am free, I have made myself a slave to righteousness. Romans 14, 17, Paul writes again to the church in Rome. Paul, remember, we would have none of this if Ananias was protesting. But because Ananias was a prey tester... Paul writes, the kingdom of God is righteousness. Not rights. Righteousness, peace, and love in the Holy Spirit. So what do I do? Well, I vote. I live. I, I am as passionate about the gospel as I am anything. As devoted financially, physically, and spiritually to the gospel as I am anything. Man, imagine. Just imagine with me for a moment. Dare I say, what if the evangelical conservative Christians were as passionate about the gospel of Jesus Christ, financially, physically, emotionally, and spiritually, as we, they are every four years during elections. What if we prayed as fervently? I vote. I communicate. I'm not afraid to have the, the, the conversation, specifically in regards to morality and absolute biblical issues, um, abortion, pornography, prostitution, pedophilia, my God help us, sodomy, um, drunkenness, revelry, the list goes on, sanctity of marriage, those are the important issues. So I can communicate with compassion and consideration, yet with absolute conviction, all at the same time, speak the truth in love. Give an account with gentleness and meekness. Jesus said this way, pray for your enemies. Pray for them. Who's your enemy? Well, I mean, Lucifer is your enemy, but the people that oppose you is what Jesus was referencing in the context of this passage. Uh, the people on the opposite side of the issue. Jesus is saying, pray for those who do not currently believe. The unbeliever. The potential children of God. Pray for them. Pray for them. That is God's desire. Well, how should I pray for him? You're going to have to write this down. We didn't put it in your notes for you. I'm closing with this. How? God, give them no peace. Write that down. Give them no peace. 
outside of your presence. God, give them no peace. Holy Spirit, pursue them relentlessly. Say their name. God, give name. No peace outside of your presence. Holy Spirit, pursue name relentlessly. Let your voice be the loudest voice that they hear. Don't leave them alone in Jesus' name. Write this down. God, send laborers. Send laborers. Acquaintances, friends, family members. God, send angels and strangers. Give them dreams and visions and signs. Speak on heaven, on the earth, and in the heavens. Send laborers, people they know and people they've never met before. Send prophets. Send pastors, evangelists, apostles, and teachers. Not in that order. Pray this, Lord, use me. Use me. Use me to win. Name that person. Use me to pray for, to intercede on behalf of, to battle in the spiritual realm. Use me to be a light that they are drawn to, a living example of your love. I'll say this as a side note, maybe worth writing down. You'll hear me say it again. The difference is not in the form of the darkness. In other words, it doesn't matter what form the darkness comes in. The difference is not what form darkness comes in. And every decade brings its own darkness. We've seen that in the beginning of this one. It doesn't matter what form the darkness becomes. The difference is in the light. That's the only thing that's going to make a difference. Doesn't matter. The difference is not in what form the darkness comes. The difference is in how the light responds. No matter what form the darkness comes. Use me. Use me. Final point. God, reveal yourself. Reveal yourself. That's the final thing you pray. God, reveal yourself. That's just how you're praying for your enemies. This is how you're praying for prodigals. This is how you're praying for people that don't believe in Jesus. This is how you pray for people of other systems of faith. This is how you pray for people on the other side of the political aisle. This is how you pray for people that oppose what you believe to be important issues. God, reveal yourself. Reveal yourself. Lord, if they glimpse, if they glance in your direction, let them sense your peace. We just go right back. Lord, let them sense your peace that can only be found in your presence. For in your presence is fullness of joy. Pray that. It's very biblical. I say this and I'm done. Become a pray tester. Become a pray tester. Reach the lost. Impact eternity. Our job has not changed in this century. This is our job. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you're a follower of Jesus, this is your job. Reach the lost and impact eternity. There's a lot of other things that you could add to that list, but they all fit right here. Reach the lost, meet people, impact eternity, grow closer to God together. Become a prey tester. Let me pray over you, God. I pray that this has not just been my words. Lord, I pray that I'm on track with you. Lord, if I'm not, then speak to me and I'll apologize. But God, help us to evaluate. Where are you in the issue? Where are you in the division? God, where are you in the disrespect, in the defamation, in the disregard? Where are you, Lord? Wherever you are, help us to find you. Help us to seek you. Help us to follow the one that really has the answer to all the issues. 
may we become a pray tester where we test ourselves in prayer. And we don't disengage in what's going on. We don't sugarcoat it. We just come with wisdom. Not adding to the issues, but bringing solutions to the table. God, a light, no matter what form in which the darkness comes. God, help us to see you and to see people as you see them. To recognize the real enemy and to fight spiritually. Lord, not to prolong. I just pray these things. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done in America. Louisiana, Eunice and the surrounding area. As it is in heaven, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, God bless you and thank you for watching.